Welcome to St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, where again we gather around the Word and are comforted and encouraged by our God's gracious promises to us. Today, for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, we hear about our amazing Savior. He amazed the people by his miracles, by his power in driving out demons. But more often, he amazed them just by his teaching, by his amazing word and his words of promise and comfort. This morning, we'll hear more about it in our lessons and in our sermon. Today, we'll be using the common service, which is printed for you in its entirety in the worship folder, beginning with our opening hymn of praise, hymn 556, Rise, Shine, You People. We ask God to be with us and to bless the service this morning. I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. In our first lesson for this morning, God, through his prophet Moses, says that he would send another prophet, one from among his people, who would speak the very words of God a prophecy about our Savior Jesus, who would teach in a way as one who had authority. Our first lesson is recorded for us in Deuteronomy 18, beginning at the 15th verse. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, When you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. This is the word of the Lord. We continue our service this morning with the psalm of the day. We'll sing together in unison Psalm 1 as it's found on page 4 of your worship folder.
In our second lesson for this morning, the Apostle Paul gives an encouragement to the Corinthians and to us that we are not to use the knowledge that is given us by God in his word just to serve ourselves. Instead, we are to use our knowledge in love to build others up, even giving up our rights. Our second lesson is recorded for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning at the first verse. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food, sacrifice to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. In our gospel lesson for this morning, we hear how Jesus amazes the people by his power in driving out a demon but even more so by his powerful teaching. The gospel lesson this morning will also serve as our sermon text. The Holy Gospel reading is written in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. People were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching. And with authority, he even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. Having heard the gospel, we now join together to encourage one another by confessing the faith that we mutually share this morning according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we continue our service with the hymn of the day. We'll sing together hymn 353, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the text chosen for today is our Holy Gospel reading from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. The day the amazing Jesus met the devil at church. Dear fellow redeemed, many years ago when I first became a pastor here, I preached a sermon that shocked some people. 
I began by saying that during the hymn, someone was laughing. And throughout the liturgy and the scripture readings, he was mocking and trying to distract people from listening to the word of God. He's here every Sunday, and he keeps doing the same thing over and over again. And I'm fed up with it, with his snide and wicked antics, and so I'm going to call him out publicly today in this service. He is the devil. When I said that, there was an audible sigh of relief. But you think about it, that is something that does make us very uncomfortable, doesn't it? Because the truth of the matter is, the devil does come to church. In fact, I believe that he never misses a single service. However, he's not here for the right reasons. He is coming to try to undermine every good thing that God has ever done and that God has given us, especially the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In fact, the first time Jesus ever publicly drove a devil out of someone was at church in the synagogue at Capernaum. It was a very significant event. And today we are transported back in time to the day the amazing Jesus met the devil at church. And we are reminded of three things. First of all, that Jesus spoke with authority. Second, that he acted with miraculous power. And third, that Jesus proved he is our Savior. It was still very early in Jesus' ministry. Jesus had just been tempted in the wilderness. And John the baptizer had been thrown into prison by Herod. And the Bible tells us that Jesus went out among the people in the area where he had been born. St. Matthew says, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. And Matthew reminds us that it was very significant he did this because it was in fulfillment to the scriptures. He says, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, <clears throat> the people living in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And then Matthew says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus began his public ministry, the Bible reminds us that he went out and he preached the good news, that is the gospel, and that he went out in all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Jesus came to proclaim the message that he was the Savior of all. Our text begins by telling us that Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Now you may know that the great temple was located in Jerusalem. And that was down in the southern part of the Holy Land near the Dead Sea. But Galilee was about 70 miles north. And so the people who lived in Galilee could not go to the temple in Jerusalem every Sabbath day. Therefore, the Jews erected synagogues, a Greek word that means to gather together. They were little churches that were in the towns and villages and outlying areas so that they had a place to worship God every Sabbath day. St. Luke tells us Jesus went into the synagogue as was his custom. Every Sabbath day, Jesus was in the habit of going to church. Think about that. You know, there are some people who say to me, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, and I say that's true. But Jesus did. <laughs> Doesn't that tell us something? Jesus was impressing upon us the importance of going to church. Not only to hear the word of God, but the writer of the book of Hebrews says, let us not stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, we don't simply go to church for ourselves, but also to encourage others to do it. Now, obviously, in these strange times of COVID-19, there are some people who can't come to church because of the threat of the virus. That's not what we're talking about. But we do make the word of God accessible. It is on TV. It is on the Internet. Some churches have live streams of their services, which is something that we are 
striving to do ourselves. The point is, Jesus saw the need to go to church. Don't we see that need? The Bible tells us crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Not only was it his custom to go to church, but to teach them the word of God. And Jesus is here with us today with the same purpose. He wants us to be strengthened and encouraged by the gospel, which frees us from sin and from the condemnation of the law. This is where you come to hear the public declaration that your sins are forgiven because Jesus Christ lived a perfect life in your place because you couldn't do it. And Jesus went to the cross and died in your place and took the punishment for your sin and paid the debt for you before God and reconciled you to the Heavenly Father. This is the place where you are reminded that Jesus took his own perfect righteousness and he put it to your credit so that through faith in him, you are justified in the sight of God. You are declared not guilty. Yes, we come here to learn that eternal life is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. And as Jesus is here among us today, the word that he preached at that time is still the same word that you hear with the same power and authority that it had then. When Jesus preached, the Bible says the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. There were many preachers and teachers in those days, just as there are today. But there was something special about Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus spoke with authority. As a matter of fact, we are reminded that when Jesus went back to his hometown of Nazareth and preached at the synagogue there, he read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And as he read, he reminded them that at that very moment, the words he was reading were being fulfilled in their ears. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am the fulfillment of the scriptures. I am the word of God incarnate. I am everything that God has promised you. Jesus spoke with amazing authority, and he acted with miraculous power. Jesus was not the only one in church that day. Our text says, Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Yes, the devil was in church, and sadly he comes on a very regular basis should be noted that the devil does some of his very worst work from within the church. As Martin Luther and C.F. Walther and others have pointed out, heresy does not come from the atheists and unbelievers outside. It comes from within the church. That's where the devil is trying to undermine us. St. Paul once said to the Corinthians, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Sad to say, there are some church bodies where it is actually the church leaders who are doing Satan's work by teaching false doctrine and undermining what God says. But, you know, you really have to wonder, how did that man who was possessed by the devil find his way into church that day? Wouldn't you think that the devil would want to get him as far away from church as he could? But the devil had evil intentions. Perhaps that man was going to start a ruckus, which would discourage believers from trusting in God. On the other hand, we see the hand of God working, don't we? Because the devil did not expect God in the flesh to come to church that day. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Make no mistake about it, the devil and his demons know who Jesus is. They know God. James tells us in his book, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. That word shudder in Greek is a word that has at its root the idea of having one's hair stand on end. The devil not only knows that God exists, he's not an atheist, but he is so terrified of what God is going to do to him on the last day that his hair stands on end in fear. You remember when Jesus cast the demon, or demons, plural, out of the man in Gadara, the man who called himself Legion because he had so many demons, 
that the demons cried out to Jesus, What do you want with us, Son of God? Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? The book of Revelation teaches that when Satan was cast out of heaven, he has come down to earth having great wrath because he knows his time is short. Yes, Satan knows that the clock is ticking. That someday Jesus will return and he will meet his ultimate demise and he and his little gang of troublemakers will be thrown into the lake of fire. But until that time, he is going to try to take as many with him as he can. If the old adage was ever true that misery loves company, it's true with Satan and his demons. The devil knew who Jesus was. But Jesus did not want the testimony or endorsement of the devil. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The devil did not come out willingly. He was like a child throwing a tantrum. He shrieked and he shook the man violently to try to get in his last attempt to harm him. But St. Luke, in his parallel account, says, The demon threw the man down before all of them and came out without injuring him. Remember, St. Luke was a doctor and he would note that detail that he was not harmed. The devil did his worst, but Jesus still protected the man. The devil could not harm him. Jesus once said, if I drive out demons with the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come to you. In other words, I can take out the devil with my little finger because Jesus has amazing power. Power over the devil. Which brings us to our last point. Jesus proved he is our savior. Why was it so significant that Jesus drove out that demon on that day in front of everyone for the first time publicly? For the same reason that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil but never gave in to him. For the same reason that following that event, Jesus would drive out many other demons because Jesus was proving his power against the devil. It was the devil who brought about the condemnation of this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. But Jesus was showing that he not only was undoing the work of the devil, but that he was conquering the devil on our behalf to free us from the devil's power. You know, we never need to, free the, we never need to fear the devil. As one of my seminary professors once wisely said, the devil is like a dangerous dog on the end of a chain. He can snap and growl and bark at us all he wants to, but as long as we are in Christ, we are outside of his circle of action. It is only when we depart from Christ that we put ourselves in jeopardy and are in Satan's territory because he is very dangerous. He's very cunning. Don't ever underestimate him. The Bible says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But C.S. Lewis reminds us in his forward to the screw tape letters, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The devils themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. In other words, the devil is just as happy with a fanatic as he is with an atheist. Because in either case, he is a master of extremes and he separates us from Christ and causes us to trust in ourselves rather than in God. We have to be careful that we do not forget that there is a devil. As C.S. Lewis says, we don't want to disbelieve in their existence because the Bible says they do exist and we need to be aware of that. On the other hand, we cannot live in fear of him or concentrate it on the devil every moment. The devil tries to get us to do that. Oh no, if I do something wrong, the devil's going to get me. No. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, no one can pluck you from my hand. It is Jesus who keeps us. John tells us in his first epistle, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, since children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he stripped Satan of all of his power. Because when Jesus took away our sin, he took away Satan's ability to accuse us any longer. He can't hold death over our head. 
He can't hold our sin against us. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The devil is a conquered enemy. And so today, like always, the devil comes to church. But today when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, God, thy kingdom come, remember what we are asking. That God would drive the devil out of our hearts and lives and that the Holy Spirit would rule in our hearts. That under God's kingdom, we would be free from the devil's power and the fear of the devil. And as we confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, Satan is driven out of the pews and out of the doors because Jesus Christ acted with authority over the devil. Our text ends by saying the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even orders the evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Look at this, the people said, it's a new teaching with authority. No, it wasn't a new teaching. It was the same thing that God taught them all the way back in the Garden of Eden when he made the promise that he would send a Savior to crush the devil's power. And that is what Jesus fulfilled. It was not a new teaching, but it was still just as amazing as when God first preached it. And the people were so amazed that they spread the word about Jesus throughout the whole region. May it be true with us as well. May we be amazed, so amazed with the amazing Jesus that we spread this word in every place just as they did on the day that the amazing Jesus met the devil at church. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we would normally take up an offering, but since we are not passing plates, we want to remind you that there is a receptacle in the narthex where you can place your offerings. If you haven't done so already, you can do so following this service. For those of you who are watching online or on television, please be reminded that you can mail your offerings directly to the church at the church address, or you can bring them directly to the church office during business hours from 8 a.m., to 1 p.m., Monday through Friday. Or you can talk to your bank about automatic withdrawal so that the bank can send money directly to the congregation. With that, we continue with the prayer of the church. We pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for sending your Son to be our amazing Savior. We thank you for the miracles that amazed and proved his divinity, and especially for his resurrection that guarantees our victory over sin, and death, and hell. We thank you also for Jesus' amazing teaching as he taught us one with authority and for sending your spirit to work through that word to bring us to faith and keep us in the faith. May we never cease to be full of amazement and wonder at the grace which you have shown, continue to show, and promise will always show to us. Help us to live for you that others too might know of your amazing grace through us. Lord of the Church, you have instituted the office of the public ministry and have given your people the privilege of extending calls to serve us through that ministry. 
Having asked for your help and guidance, our congregation has called Emily Stirring to be our teacher at St. Paul's Lutheran School on a permanent basis. We have also called Jim Dretzky to serve as our part-time staff minister. We ask that as Emily prayerfully considers her call, you would guide her to a decision that is in the best interest of your kingdom. And as you have led Jim to accept our call to serve, we pray that you would grant him the wisdom to use the gifts you have given him faithfully to fulfill his ministry among us. Help us honor and respect him as your gift to our congregation. Enable us to work together with all our called workers in a spirit of harmony and love, that your kingdom may flourish and more might come to know of your amazing work for us and of your amazing grace. Compassionate Father, in your mercy you transform even sickness and disease into a blessing for your children. With this confidence, we commit all who are sick or suffering to your tender care. But we pray especially for John Paulson, who was diagnosed with lung cancer this past week. As he and Lolly look at treatment plans, we pray that you would provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant them peace and patience, and in the midst of uncertainty, help them to find their strength in you and in your certain promises. Almighty God, by the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, you destroyed death. By his rest in the tomb, you sanctified the graves of your saints. And by his glorious resurrection, you brought life and immortality to light, so that all who die in him live forever in peace and joy. Be with the family of Pastor John Molstad, the president of our sister synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, who died suddenly and unexpectedly of a heart attack on Friday. Also be with the family of Roger Kloxim, as his sister Ruth Wardeen went to be with you in eternal glory yesterday morning. Receive our thanks for bringing our brother and sister in Christ to faith, for keeping them in that faith, and for granting them the victory over death that you have given to all believers. Comfort their families as they mourn, and keep all of us who wait for our joyful reunion with you, faithful to you and your word, until we receive that blessed end. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory with all your saints and angels and sing the everlasting song of triumph. Now hear us, Lord, as we join to pray the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we continue with our next hymn, hymn 379. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
I invite you to stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Congregation may be seated as we continue with our closing hymn. We'll sing stanzas one through three of hymn 82, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. 